We have questions about heaven. We're trying to answer from the Bible. Will I really meet God? And who will I meet there? And will I know my loved ones? Those are questions that people want to know. We'll try to answer them today in the Bible class, The Wonders of Heaven. I'm Pastor Ken Larson. I'm a visitation pastor with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And this is our Bible study. We always invite you to join us 8.30 or 10.30 Sundays, online or in person. And there's the, there's the indication, the website, trinitydelray.org slash live. If you are in the Delray, Delray Beach, Florida area, come to the corner of Swinton and Lake Ida. And there you'll find us, and that's what the church looks like. You're welcome here. Let's go to the wonders of heaven. What does the Bible tell us about heaven? I think that's something that people want to know. They don't think about it every day. But we know the way to heaven, which we have already talked about last time. How did how do we get in? How do we knock on the door? It's because he has knocked on the doors of our hearts through the preaching of the gospel, through the water and word of baptism. We were invited. You don't get in without the Lord's invitation. But today, we'll try to tackle this question, will I really meet God? Maybe you haven't thought about that. And who will I meet there? And who won't be there? That is connected with the third question, will I know my loved ones? I think that's one thing we yearn to have a reunion with those who have gone on before us. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and there you'll get a great indication. I don't think we're going to get to question 4 today. But I really want to because there are so much description of heaven all over the Bible. So kind of hang on for that, would you? And so we'll go to this question, will I really meet God? The answer is yes. What, What does the Bible say about our meeting God? King David knew. He writes in Psalm 17, In righteousness, I will see your face. I think that's something that is worthy of our study, but not today. What is the face of God? All right, I'm not going to answer it. I want you to think about what is the face of God? Job, you remember Job, he had endless agonies. He confessed, in my flesh, I shall see God. I myself will see him. You see, in his own Old Testament way of thinking, because it was not fully informed by our New Testament, he believed in some kind of a resurrection, a life after this life. All right? And Jesus promised, blessed are the, are the pure in their heart, for they will see God. Now that word see is a, is a literal seeing we know that we have been warned that no one shall look upon God and live. And even Isaiah only saw uh, uh, the backside of God. And so also others in the Old Testament. But those who have seen Jesus have seen God, haven't they? If you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father said Jesus. What does the Bible say about meeting God? More promises from Jesus. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. The Apostle John's vision assures us that all who worship God in heaven will see his face. Revelation chapter 22. That's the last chapter in the Bible. There's a promise that you can hang on to. Well, I I want Judy to start reading if she's willing from, please. 
First John 3, uh, 3 uh, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we shall see him as he is. We shall see him. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's think about that. Uh, Joanne, would you be willing to read? Sure. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part that I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Thank you. That's St. Paul, who received mm -hmm. a number of special revelations from the Lord. And this is one of them in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, you will remember, is the love chapter. The love chapter. You have taken by faith the reality of your own resurrection, haven't you? You've taken that from the promise of the resurrection of Jesus and his promise, because I live, you too shall live. You take hold of that whenever you're worried about death. You take the resurrection right to your last moment. You will see Jesus in Christ's perfect righteousness, which you will wear as your robe you will face the holy god and you'll do so without any fear at all there's there's no fear in love because perfect love his perfect love casts out fear well, let's go on to another subtopic of the wonders of heaven well who will i meet in heaven beside god who will i meet in heaven now there have been books written about this uh, there is one book i'm familiar with I don't have, who are the first five people you will meet in heaven? That's speculation. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a scripture promise about that. There are other speculations when people think about who I'm going to meet, and it goes this way. There's going to be two surprises. Maybe you've heard this. The two surprises of heaven is, number one, you will see people there that you didn't expect to be there. <laughs> Oh, but it'll be joyful. There are people you expect to see in heaven who won't be there. Who won't be there. And the promise that I want to help you with on that score is that because there is no sadness or sorrow in heaven, it won't be something of your great concern. That was in God's hands, as it always was. And those we wanted to be there aren't. I think that we can have that sadness now, while it can still make a difference if they are still among the living. You think yeah. about that. And the people that you love in your family, whose relationship to the church, but more specifically to their Lord and Savior, is in your mind at least doubtful you're not sure about it I, I i i hate to put it to you this way but it is true that you might be the only one to help them see their connection the connection that god wants with them the evangelistic message from the church does not reach these people if you put your phone on silent if you disconnect your phone, no one can call you. If you separate yourself from God's avenues of grace, the word and the sacraments, how is he going to come to you? Well, I know of nurses who have witnessed their faith to those when they are privately at the bedside outside of their office as nurse and doctors outside of their calling vocation as a doctor have been the carriers of the good news 
You can do that while there is still life and breath. I'm going to stop that sermon because I've said enough. <laughs> I know the sorrow that you anticipate. Well, here's a way to circumvent that. Who will I meet in heaven? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's a precious Bible promise. Encircle it with your heart and make it yours. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's the same shepherd. He is the same shepherd who watches over you, feeds you, leads you by the quiet waters and makes sure that you have bread for today. He knows you. He knows you intimately. And he still loves you because there is forgiveness in his heart because he has shed his blood for you. He laid down his life for you. And that's going to be true always and ever and constantly. So you're going to meet in heaven people who know the shepherd. The residents of heaven are those who know Jesus as their shepherd. And they know and they believe that Jesus really did lay down his life for them. That's their faith. They hang on to that with bulldog tenacity. With bulldog tenacity. You got that? To follow Jesus. It means to believe that he laid down his life only to take it up again. And that was and is his blessed work for us and his promise. This is not going to change. All right? There's not a second New Testament. This is this is it, folks. Take hold of it every day for yourself and those you love. Who will I meet in heaven? Included in those we meet in heaven are all the Old Testament believers. We don't know all their names. Neither do I. We know the prominent ones. Abraham. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Isaiah. Oh, yes. He saw the Christ. And so did many others of note, but also people who didn't have a great name. They were listed. Oh, boy, I've been reading First Chronicles, and I, I've gone today now into Second Chronicles where Solomon takes over after David's death. David is with the saints in heaven. And here we have some people listed in First Chronicles whose names you can't even pronounce. You don't know them, but they were priests and they served with faith in the temple of the Lord. Oh, no, in the tabernacle temple. Temple wasn't built yet. But they were servants of the Most High God and believed in him. I'm not talking about those problems with the false sacrifices that we studied uh, We studied in Malachi. I'm talking about those believers whose names are barely mentioned. All of them will be those we meet in heaven. I guess it'll take a long time to meet them all. Uh, but we have eternity. Those who put their faith in the Lord. Saints in heaven experience joy and pleasure. Unlike saints on earth, they never are grouchy or grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> if, That's you, a good thing. if you have occasion to call customer service, <laughs> which is an oxymoron, <laughs> Uh, I uh, don't know if we need phones in heaven. Uh, it might be, <laughs> might be one of the joys in heaven not to have. Amen. Mine. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> uh, but we won't be grouchy or grumpy, not even first thing in the morning where, until I get my coffee um, or hungry. That's a wonderful thing to look forward to. And they never complain. I think one of the sins of Americans, of all economic classes, 
is that we never seem to have enough or the right things or the right time. We never have enough time. And you know what you complain about. I know what I complain about. I'm, I'm chastened by the, <clears throat> the fact that in the Old Testament, the people who murmured against God met a, what we would call an untimely death. Don't complain, said my father, when I didn't like my grandmother's cooking. <laughs> he would say it between clenched teeth, so she couldn't hear it, but I could. He said, don't complain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we never learn. The, the saints in heaven, the believers, are supremely and completely satisfied. That's why they don't complain. That's what Jesus promised. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Ah. Who will I meet in heaven? These believers, unfettered by sin, untouched by illness, and completely different from our struggle. The residents in heaven shine like the stars. Read Daniel 12, verse 3, Jamie, if you're ready. Yes, Daniel 12, 3. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Wow. <laughs> shine like the brightness of the sky like stars. Here's a promise, kind of unexpected from the Old Testament, huh? Sounds more like something that would be in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Who will I meet in heaven? Uh, read uh, back to you, please, uh, Judy. Read level, Revelation 7. Uh, verses 9 through 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our god who sits on the throne and to the lamb that's um, a multitude you know the people on mm -hmm. this side of heaven are found of we are fond of counting we count money and people all the time. We look around during the summer at the empty pews and say, where are the multitudes? We count, uh, I think we count too much because our success as pastors, church leaders, is not measured by God in terms of numbers. Yes, I know. He counted numbers on Pentecost, 3,000. A little bit later, he, he counted. He inspired them to count, and they did. And Luke recorded 5,000. After that, they stopped counting because there were so many they could not count. As the, the narrative in the book of Acts goes on and on and on with more people coming in. But that doesn't compare to the multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And there was no prejudice in the whole group. I want you to take note of that, considering all the problems we have now, looking at people who are different and wondering how we can get along in this world of ours. It is hard. Yeah. It was easier, I think, when we lived in a small community in a small part of a city like Chicago and all of the people in our area of Chicago were pretty much all alike. And the people who were different from us, well, they gathered over there in another part and we knew they were there and they were members of that group and we seldom got together. But then television happened and, and the phones happened and 
worldwide communication happened and we had to deal with people who were different. It's, it's, it's challenged us. And then they came to what we called our nation. And then they lived next door or across the street. And we have been challenged to deal with cultures and languages that we just don't understand. I don't have a solution except to love people one at a time and to look past what your eyes see and look at the heart that God sees. And that's good. I'm going to end that sermon there. I don't often go on that tangent, do I? And I know, <laughs> listen, I know how it is. They're clothed in white robes. That's the righteousness of Christ. And we're doing what they did on Palm Sunday, <laughs> crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God. And he has given it to us. No, well, that's quite a scene, isn't it? Mm -hmm. wow. Who will we not meet in heaven? Oh, wow. unrepentant sinners who rejected and spurned the Lord's invitation when he said, repent and believe the gospel. It's a simple message. Jesus died for you. He rose for you. It's a simple message. You have sinned. And I have sinned, and we need God's forgiveness. Here it is. Take it. He's inviting you in. Oh, whose turn is it? Uh, Joanne, would you be willing to read Revelation 21? Sure. Revelation 21, 27. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. No sin. The sin we had was forgiven so that when we enter, we are declared clean. Mm -hmm. That's the same idea, different word, but the same, the same idea as righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. That's from, Jer that's from Jeremiah 31. This is the name by which it will be called. The Lord our righteousness, the Lord, comma, noun and apposition for the grammarians. We will meet repentant sinners who by God's free grace believed in the gospel, believed that Jesus lived and suffered and died and rose for them. It's a one at a time thing. But right after the one at a time thing, the coming to faith, then there is the inclusion in the body of Christ. And I guess it's the most, it's not the most memorized passage. I told you before the Lord's Prayer is from Matthew 6, the most memorized passage, right? But yeah. everybody thinks this is the gospel in a nutshell, yes, but this is the, the John 3.16. The reason that we have the gospel is that he loved us not only to perform it, not only to see that it would happen for us, <clears throat> that the, the Son of God went voluntarily to the cross to, to accomplish our salvation, but also that he delivered it to us so that we would say, by faith, I believe that you love me, that your only son died for me. And I know that because I believe in him, and that's by God's grace that I do that, by, by God's grace that you believe, that you have everlasting life. Those are the people you meet in heaven. It's not based on knowledge. And it is certainly not based on works, by faith, through faith alone. Now, the wonders in heaven, we're going to go to another subtopic. I seem to be rushing on today. We'll see what we can cover. Um, what does the clock say here? We've only used up a little bit less than half of our time together. Well, let's see how far we go. Well, I know my loved ones. 
The simple answer is yes. I would like the Bible to have been more complete about this or easier to understand. So I've searched for and found some Bible passages that speak to this in a general way. And in a couple of cases, in specific ways that the believers in the Bible uh, spoke of it or experienced it. I suppose just as important for our knowing our loved ones is they'd recognize me. Is, does anybody remember Eric Clapton, the singer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. This is a heart rendering, tear producing Well, let's just go to it. Yeah. On March 20th, 1991, Eric Clapton lost his son, Connor, in a horrible accident. He was four years old and he fell out of an open window. I don't know what he was doing on the 53rd story of a, of a large building, but he fell and died. So Mr. Clapton, a singer and writer, wrote a touching song, pondering whether or not Connor would recognize him. If the tune goes through your head, that's fine. I shan't sing it, <laughs> uh, but this is how it goes. Would you know my name? Would you feel the same? I must be strong and carry on because I know I don't belong here in heaven. I don't know if Eric was speaking about his own faith or lack thereof, but maybe he was just admitting that as a sinner, he didn't belong there. And this this song ends with this wondering beyond the door there's no peace or there's peace i'm sure beyond the door there's peace i'm sure and i know there will be no more tears in heaven mm -hmm. legally i should have the copyright notice there i'm sorry about that people i try to obey the copyright law and it's not fair use uh so what you do is you put the copyright so nobody else takes it. By using it without the copyright notice, you kind of cleanse it. And then the next person says, well, it looks like it's in the public domain. It is not in the public domain. Mr. Clapton copyrighted it himself. And then ASCAP or BMI got hold of it and license and all that stuff. Let's go on uh, with the next reader. Uh, Jamie, are you willing to read? Sure. Okay, this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself with a cry of command, but the archangels call and with the sound of God's trumpet will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. In what way is that comforting to you? Well, all the dead and you, and ourselves will all be together, and we all get to go to the Lord together, and forever. Together, isn't that a wonderful word? After we've been separated for a year and a half, <laughs> isn't it a wonderful word uh, that we got back into worship? Many of us, and um, we were singing together. We didn't sing 
by ourselves at the breakfast table while we watched the service. Neither Janie nor I are good enough to sing to ourselves. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to. But we're together now. That's the thing. When the Lord comes, you'll know. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That's going to be an amazing sight. There was a prefiguring of that when, uh, when Jesus was crucified. And it's a very confusing, difficult passage to understand. But some of those who had died came out of the tombs and were seen alive. What? I don't think you've heard sermons preached on that, but there it is. And I believe it's in the Gospel of Matthew hmm. at the time of the crucifixion. When there was the earthquake and the darkness, there were seven miracles. All happened at once. Well, this is the dead in Christ will rise first, but then we who are alive, our left, will be caught up. And that's the thing that many people in the evangelical churches talk about when they're talking about the rapture. The word rapture isn't in the Bible, but this is what they mean, caught up in the clouds together with them. Of course, they have two second comings of the Lord, and we only have one, as the Bible puts it. So I'm not going to go into the, oh, no, I'm not going to go into that today. But we'll be caught up in the clouds you know how Jesus was received in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this brings up the question, where is heaven? Heck, you won't find it on a map. It, it just, it, it's up there. And forever in the Bible, it's, it's up. Well, the way I read the scriptures, I think of heaven not so much as a place, but as the new experience of all of God's people in the presence of God and God with us in a way that we've never understood and never experienced before. It's different and it's so different that it cannot be explained in words. That's why, I suppose it's why, that Jesus gave a vision to the Apostle John, and then John wrote it down in words. And uh, I don't understand all those words. But I do understand this. Together with them, we'll meet the Lord in the air. Mm. We'll know them. They will be with us. How we all get together, I don't know, without FaceTime or okay. uh, uh, Facebook. I, uh, the geography is not the limiting thing because it's an experience of being with God and no sin, nothing in the way. It, it is difficult to describe in human terms. But we're talking about our knowing our loved ones. When Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, you remember that Peter, James, and John, the inner circle of the 12, they were with Jesus on the Holy Mount, as Peter uh, relates in First Peter, and he was transfigured. But the point of my bringing this up now is that they recognized Moses, and they recognized Elijah. And then this question came up last week. I think it was last week. Uh, someone asked about whether Moses was in heaven, because uh, he could not see and was not allowed to go into the he, he could see, but he was not allowed to go into the promised land. And I said that the promised land was a metaphor for heaven. Well, maybe I spoke too much because it gave the impression that Moses was not in heaven. Oh, yes. He didn't go into the promised land, but he was with Elijah when Jesus was transfigured. And Peter, James, and John recognized Moses and Elijah, and he, Peter even wanted to build two booths for those two and one for Jesus. Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay there and celebrate. Mm -hmm. Peter, you just you just don't get it. <laughs> I was going to say, Peter's personality didn't change in heaven, did it? 
<laughs> uh, in heaven, I don't know. I don't want to say that. But, <laughs> but I, I think I think it changed. Oh yeah, yeah I mean, but still, he still it didn't change there. on the mountain. Yeah. Man, no. Yeah. yeah, but he still wanted to do things that oh, were <laughs> were he, were he, not he, necessary. <laughs> until Acts chapter ten, Peter was always popping off his mouth, objecting to God's ways. And I said Acts 10 because that's when Jesus, uh, when he was uh, given the vision of the sheep coming down from heaven, the all kinds of unclean things, and he was told to kill and eat. And he said, I have never eaten anything unclean. <laughs> he, thought it was a, he thought it was a test. <laughs> and uh, the voice came from heaven, don't call anything unclean that God has declared clean. <laughs> and I suppose it wasn't recorded, but I suppose Peter said, Oh, and, and then he had to go to the house of Cornelius and, and, and a very distasteful th thing for him, a Jew, to go to a Gentile's house and then come in and eat with them. Oh, it was difficult, but he was shown that the kingdom of heaven included the Gentiles. You talk about your pre prejudices. You realize <laughs> How hard, I'm, I'm serious, you realize how hard that prejudice was ingrained in the hearts of the people who were told to stay separate. Mm -hmm. And now God's saying, uh, get together with them. Oh, that was hard. The next time we meet Peter, he's being opposed by, by of all people, Paul and told him he's got it all wrong. Same issue. And the next time we meet Peter, he's writing a letter and he has changed. He has been humbled and he is open. Huh. Well, God is patient with us. That's the lesson to learn there. And though we don't all get it right now, there's a lot of things I don't get. We don't get it right now. But maybe shut your mouth and stop objecting to God's ways. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Take it up with the complaint department. Where is that? There isn't any. <laughs> well, I know my loved ones. Yes, God promised Abraham he would go to his ancestors in peace. You realize who Abraham's ancestors were? Adam and Eve. Yes, <laughs> you want to go back that far, <laughs> but in a more direct way, the people of Ur of the Chaldees. Okay. Where's Ur? Mesopotamia, way down there by the, by the Gulf. He would go there. So he did. Abraham died in faith, and then Abraham was gathered to his people. The Lord afflicted the child. Oh, this 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 is a this is a difficult and long story, and I'm abbreviating it severely. The Lord had his way with David, even though David did not go in God's way. David saw Bathsheba, wanted her, took her as his own, and then had Uriah killed in the heat of battle. So, and then lied about it, refused to admit up, to admit his sin. We meet David in 1 Samuel 12, 2 Samuel 12. And the punishment, well, you want to take, take this up with God if you don't like it or understand it. David was allowed to live, but his the child of this adulterous relationship died. But while the child was still sick, David prayed and fasted. But after his son died, David washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Isn't that amazing? And then he went to his own house. And then when he asked for it, they set food before him and he ate. And they wanted to know 
why did you end your fasting now that the child is dead? And he answered, hmm, Judy? While the child, okay, uh, 2 Samuel 12, verses 22 and 23. While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Wow. I shall go to him. When he says, I shall go to him, is he referring Christ or Jesus or the Lord? Mm -hmm. to, he will go. He will go to see his son. Oh, his son. He's referring to his son then. Okay. The antecedent of the pronoun has to be the child because it's. Yeah. Uh, the Lord is more distant. That's the rule. Unless you know the Hebrew and can do a better job of that, right. I'd have to hold judgment. Now, is he, is he, he will not return to me has, has got to be, uh, that's determinative. He will go to the child. He believes that. And how much he knew of the resurrection, I don't know. Okay. When you read the Psalms of David, you realize he believed in the afterlife, that there was something beyond the grave. Uh, it, the resurrection was taught in the Old Testament. So, you know, you learn something about prayer here. Look, uh, look how David words it. Who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me. Mm -hmm. When you pray, thy will be done. This is really what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. Who knows whether the child will live? Uh, this is close to my heart today because there is a great grandchild, this little bitty lady named Amelia. It's amazing. Oh, it's, it's just amazing what they do. You know how it, how it was described by mom. Uh, Samantha said he she has more wires in her than my husband has hooked up to his computer. <laughs> uh, I have a picture of it. I've spared you that. Uh, the wonders of heaven. I'm wondering if you have wonders of heaven that I could write down as a possible question. I did write one down last week. Um, okay, we're going to go into the next subtopic. Let's see what the time says here. Oh, yes, we got about 15 minutes. Let's go on now. Huh? We do. Questions, comments, applications. This is the time. Let's see. Okay, okay. Keep them in mind. What is heaven like? There's no way that I can exhaust all the Bible passages that are there, especially in the book of Revelation. I will refer you to that sometimes difficult book. Yeah, it is. Pick up what you can. You remember I've told you this many times in studying the Bible with you. If you don't understand the whole chapter, find a paragraph. And if you don't understand the paragraph, find a sentence. Find a message from God in one of the sentences or the phrases. Um, and when you read Revelation, don't worry that you don't understand all the visions. They were meant for the first century believers and the Apostle John knew that they would understand. And 20 centuries later, the picturesque language, it appears to be hidden from us. 
I said appears. Okay. What is the most famous city in the Bible? Jerusalem. Any other guesses? Babylonia. Yeah. Any other? Heaven? Heaven? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say Rome. <laughs> oh. Um, it is Jerusalem. And there are two Jerusalems. There's a great contrast between the old Jerusalem and the new Jerusalem. We have not seen the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem has been the center of controversy and conflict for 30 centuries. The name means the, the city of the peace of God. Well, this is the city Abraham waited for, whose architect and builder is God. Do you realize how God was the architect of the tabernacle, and God was the architect of the temple, and God was the architect of the second temple, which was standing at the time of Jesus, and God knew that it would be torn down, and in 70 AD it was, but God is the architect of the beautiful new Jerusalem. And Abraham was waiting for that. See, long before Abraham could see the first temple. Right? Hmm. The, the first temple wasn't even in the sight of any man or woman in Abraham's day. That does not come until later on. When Solomon built the temple. Okay. A lot of history goes on. So Abraham waited for it. Well, what, what was he waiting for? Not Jerusalem, but the city to which he would be called. That's from that he hero's of the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. And by faith, he was waiting for that. And he died with that faith. Romans chapter four says that that was credited to him as righteousness. And that's how he got into heaven, to see the new Jerusalem. Well, I'm getting ahead of it now, because the new Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. Ah, Jamie, I think it falls to you to read this predictive passage from Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah 65, 17 through 19. For I'm about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I'm about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. You realize that Isaiah is looking way down into the new Jerusalem. The new heavens and the new earth, that hasn't happened yet. But he tells us while we wait to rejoice, he's going to create Jerusalem as a joy. This is God's new Jerusalem. The sound of weeping won't be heard there, nor will we hear the cry of distress. I don't know what you nurses are going to do in heaven. There won't be any sickness. <laughs> well, we won't be nurses. Yeah. Well, they don't need preachers there either. I, I'm out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I see this is unusual. We have three semi-retired nurses. Uh, retired nurses. Yeah. I don't think that's ever happened before. Just the three of you. Uh, Joanne, would you read? Psalm 
2 Peter 3, 7 through 10. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Wow. You realize how God is going to recreate? He's not going to just fix it up. You know, you can buy a fixer-up house and then live in it for a year. Got to live in it for a year so that your capital gains tax won't be as high. And then you fix it while you live in it and then you can sell it at a gain and only pay uh, what's called the regular taxpayer rates, not capital gains. Save some taxes. No, uh, the the Lord is not going to use the earth as a fixer upper. He's going to dissolve it. Roar. Heavenly bodies burned up, dissolved. Earth, nothing, gone. And in the place of that, he will create a new heaven and a new earth. Judy. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 11 and 11 through 13. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives, be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let, let this happen. Get rid of all the nonsense and the sin that is going on and give us a place where holiness and righteousness dwell and no sin enters. You realize... We're doing the best we can to live in the place and in the way that God has given us. And that's what he wants us to do. While he keeps our faith alive through the word and the sacrament and the remembrance of our baptism, that we are his. And we're not going to be burned up in fire in this. I hope that's clear to you. That that's when, whether we are alive or dead, when he comes, we don't know which it'll be, that in either case, we get a 1 Corinthians 15 body. Go ahead, Paul, try to describe to us what that's like. He, uh, no, he um, does the best he can, but we don't get much revelation there as to what a spiritual body will be like. Uh, I'm just taking an order, uh, Jamie, please. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Good news. 
Yes, you know, a, a question just came up to me. Um, so if we should die now and we should go to heaven now, will there even be a more glorious heaven after the second coming of Christ? Is that what it's saying? This is a mystery. Okay. Um, That's easier to understand. Just it's a mystery. Well, we don't know. It's a mystery. I'll just say this, that we don't believe in a soul sleep. But because God is timeless, when we die, our spirit goes to heaven. Okay, and it is awesome. with God. Mm -hmm. And then the second coming comes when all of this happens that is described in Second Peter and here in Revelation. Well, this happens. It seems to us who are time bound as though there's this waiting period, doesn't it? And this, well, what do we do while we wait? The well, Bible doesn't still... speak to the waiting. Uh, it only speaks to the happening. So mm -hmm. what I have, I have understood with my limited understanding, and that is that it appears to us is that it's instantaneous. Or there is a, a, a waiting room that must be pretty big. I'm, well, it, it, you know, it says previously there is no time that a thousand years is like a day and a day no. is like a thousand years. Yeah. So that might answer that part of that question of timelessness. Timelessness, right. Yeah, well, uh, uh, here's the other answer. You'll know when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay <Be> ready <laughs> all right and it won't be scary it won't be fearful we're going to get to that no tears no tears no death no mourning no crying no pain tylenol we don't need you <laughs> no suffering yeah. picture it no struggle to survive why not god will provide that's yeah. it thank you there is no thirst because the shepherd constantly leads a sheep to springs of water. And if you want to put in uh, John chapter four, it can be living water. Sir, give me this water so I don't have to come here and draw. Oh, you just don't understand, do you? Okay, I am the water of life. Hardships, none. No, no suffering, trials, afflictions. Nope, not a one. Recession, nope, no inflation either. I don't think we need money there. So there's no striving after money. There's no oppression. There's no prejudice. There are no peoples whose righteousness is suppressed. There's no cancer. Oh, hooray, 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 hooray. This little girl has congenital heart disease. Her aunt had a similar problem. He got it? Mm -hmm. Is her maternal aunt. Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's? <laughs> oh, think of John, Judy. No, I know. Yeah, you know, oh. all the dementias. Oh, no. Yeah. That dementia is gone. Now I see and I understand there's no pain, no weariness. Some days at eight o'clock, I want to go to bed. Jeannie, can I go to bed now, please? <laughs> uh, partly the disease and partly our age. Uh, I, don't I know. think, you know, these are all the things that at a funeral we, uh, we rejoice in having to leave behind. Yes, absolutely. This is a, a funeral address, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning that. I've been to a lot of funerals, done a lot of funerals, and I always mention no tears. Tears are God's way of cleaning our eye ducts. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. and tears are God's way of letting us vent an emotion that mm -hmm. is common to all people, mm -hmm. and that is we suffer losses. Ouch. But we learn after suffering a few losses that it doesn't kill us. You and I are survivors. And when there is the threat of loss, we steel ourselves against that 
with the promises of God. Amen. And we pray, thy will be done, but Lord, you know my will, that there be life and not death. Yes, he knows that. When you realize the tenderness of God, the tenderness of God is wrapped wrapped around his love for us, and it's like a, a, a soft gift. It's like an arm around the shoulder. It's like a, a pleasant look from someone's eye. He helps us in our afflictions. Read the Bible on the word affliction. So why can we be sure of heaven in these terms? My question to you. Because the Bible says so. Yeah, that's a good answer. There's, there's tons of promises. Maybe you could uh, get a Bible and do nothing in that Bible but underline the promises. You'd be busy. Yeah, I think for... all, all, these, all these earthly, what we could, would call earthly things, yeah. uh, God's joy can't, uh, um, can't be taken away. His joy will be, be, be with us forever. That's true. Thank you. As there's no sin. I think that this is one of the greatest things about heaven. Hmm. Sin, sin can't enter there, right? No sin. And therefore, there are no more consequences for sin. You and I suffer the consequences of our sin and the sin of others and the fact that we live in a fallen world. Things don't work right here. But Christ has borne our sin. He has taken sin away permanently. <clears throat> In heaven, it is not. It is not a category of our thought or our experience. So what would it be like? Can you imagine to live in a world without sin? We wouldn't have all those things on the previous page to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are really good at summarizing. I don't have to say anything. <laughs> Uh, there's no temptations to sin. I have thought about this. Amidst the many temptations of sin in this world, when, if there were no temptations, I could get along pretty well. I know that the devil and the world and the flesh, they, those three, those unholy three, they combine. <laughs> they are our true enemies. Like all those chocolate covered donuts <laughs> well, that's in that yes temptations I, when i come to church i i walk by those yeah, i know you're there i ate at home so the reason that there's no temptations to sin is that in heaven the unholy three are gone satan has been destroyed the wicked world and its ways are gone, and none of our sinful flesh comes along with us. Hey. That really sums it up for me. And so, we can live for the first time in our experience a righteous life with a righteous God. That's heaven incomparable beauty. And this is where I said, I cannot write down all the passages in the Bible that talk about the beauty of heaven. I'm sorry oh. to interrupt everyone, but I must go. But everyone have a good week and enjoy getting back together again upstairs next week. Okay. Okay, okay Jamie. See you there. Okay Thank you. July. Thank you. Bye, Jamie. Uh, you'll, you'll get this in the email in a couple hours. All right. Okay. Thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to finish up in the next few minutes. Uh, you know, Dee, I am very sorry. I misspoke earlier when I said that the three nurses are with us and I didn't include you. I said you were not a nurse. No, that's okay. <laughs> Forgive me for only three were on the screen at the time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know why you can't put more on the screen. If you put them all on the screen, you can't see the words, you know. 
Right. Well, this is the last time. Yay. <laughs> I've enjoyed Zoom for over a year now. And it's all we had. Incomparable beauty in heaven. No Zoom there. Because <laughs> heaven is perfect in every respect. D, would you read? Revelation 22, 1. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. Uh, I call my wife the fruit Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> Because every day she serves up one or more pieces or bowls of fruit, and um, she doesn't have to say, eat it. I know <laughs> if it's there, there is this, it's more than an invitation. She's trying to keep me healthy, and I think that's love because <laughs> I know it's love because she wants me to keep her up, keep me around her. Kill the bugs and open uh, heart, uh, the jar tops. <laughs> I don't know how you ladies get along without someone to open the jar tops. And don't forget the tomatoes. You got to take care of those. <laughs> well, uh, uh, those are either in the freezer or they're that's uh, they're, that's over now. They're all done, huh? <laughs> yeah, all done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> we're kind of relieved about that. It was a great <laughs> gift. Uh, heaven is very real. The vision that Jesus Christ the resurrected Jesus showed the apostle John was a vision, but it's a reality. It's not a dream that might come true. This is what I will show you of what will come to pass. You understand how the revelation is given? This will come to pass. Oh, God. And Jesus is speaking, so we know it's going to happen. Jesus gave John the vision and told him, write down what you see. The heaven that is real is much, much more than relief from pain. It's more than the absence of frustration or more than the absence of sin. Jesus points us to that complete satisfaction that our souls long for. Yes. When you get honest with yourself inside of yourself, you realize I will always be incomplete here, but then I will be completed. What is heaven like? No fear. Why is that? I, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> Why is there no fear in heaven? Because God's there. All right. Well, and you're not, and you're not afraid? Probably, yeah, we probably won't have fear and know the feeling of fear. That's correct. One of those negative uh, yeah. things. Judy, right. you can read the answer here. Okay, First John four eighteen. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfect, perfected in love. The word perfected means brought to its goal or its completion, which will happen in heaven. But there's no punishment left. The child is afraid of punishment. And sometimes that's the only thing that keeps a child or people who are citizens of a nation in check from certain kinds of sin against, well, like speeding laws and stealing from a bank. Only fear of punishment. Well, if you consider uh, the punishment that would be due to us, his perfect love casts out that fear because in heaven, the punishment has been laid upon Christ and there is none for us. Absolutely no punishment necessary ever again. No fear. What is heaven like? This face to face with God, which we don't completely understand how could that be possible? What is that like? That God is going to be with his people in a way that we've never known, never could have known in our sinful state. And now, you know, we get to commune with God by faith, with his word and in the sacrament. We're close to him, as close as sinners can be to the holy God. 
We commune with God. Christ is present and received in the Lord's Supper. But then, what will that be like face to face? Will we be afraid? No, because the sin that made us want to hide from God, beginning in, in Genesis chapter 3, they hid from God because they were ashamed. Mm -hmm. Well, and we don't need to hide from God. There's no shame in heaven. Didn't mention that one. Jesus shed his blood for you, and the Father has accepted that sacrifice as good for all. It's complete, it's sufficient, and it's free. You don't need to hide from God anymore. You know, you don't have to make up excuses. An excuse is, is a lie that is wrapped up in your own reasoning. The wonders of heaven are really wonderful. I don't know at this moment whether I'm going to present the next subtopic uh, upstairs on July 11th, a week from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I haven't decided. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The wonders of heaven, what will we do there? I haven't decided what to do. If you pray about it, then um, I will pray about it and we'll see what we can do upstairs. Whether it's gonna be PowerPoint or... Okay, I've got a lot to say to you. I'll say it to you in the next few weeks. I love you and I want you to enjoy what God has given you in this promise of heaven the wonderful wonders think about it wonder about it pray about it and ask yes. god to keep you busy in his work until he comes lord god here is the here's your word which promises us that our wondering will now in in one instance in one instant come to an end and what we wonder about will be our reality. Until then, Lord God, keep us in the faith. Grant us to love one another and to know what love really is, to sacrifice a little bit of ourself for someone else. Here and there and everywhere as we meet them, pray for them, listen to them, take groceries to them and whatever else our heart moves us to do. Uh, grant us that loving way of working here while we keep our faith in you as we pray through the name of jesus christ Amen. god's people Amen. always say Amen. Amen.